So today, what I'd like to talk to you about is how do you as a builder, and we're gonna primarily be talking to you builders, but this really, uh, if you're here thinking about building your own home or hiring a builder to work with you on building a home, it'll apply to everybody. But we wanna talk about how we can use Intercept ready to assemble structural insulated panels to meet the wants and needs, the priorities, the goals of your customers. Your customers come to you with a specific set of wants and needs, things that they want to have into their project and things that they need to have in their project. And so how can you use Intercept SIPs to, to help them get there? Now, you know, as a builder, it's important to listen to your customer. Uh, we're building primarily custom homes. Uh, now, if you're building a spec, you may have specific wants and needs that you want to put into a spec house as well. But what we're going to talk about is, is primarily that idea of a customer coming to you and, and how do you find out what's important to them? Because what was important to your last customer or your next customer or even yourself might not have anything to do with the current customer that you're sitting across the table with. Now, when I was building houses for folks, I would encourage them to literally write down on a piece of paper, a needs list. These are some things that I absolutely have to have in this project. And I would tell them, you, you need to plant some flags. <laughs> These are some things that are, are non-negotiable that you have to have in the project. And, and then on the other side of the page, write down your wants. And that wants list can be all over the place. It can be a, a glass garage door. It can be a see-through fireplace. It can be uh, as extravagant as an individual wants to go. And then we take that wants or needs and wants list and we design and we build around that list. The danger of not making the list and actually putting it down on paper is we've seen times when an individual gets through the process of design where there's a lot of decisions to make, there's a lot of redesign, there's a lot of new information that's coming in and the whole design gets done and all of a sudden they realize we designed out some of our needs and we absolutely needed a first floor laundry and we lost it. Or I needed a home office, but I don't have it. Or I wanted my house, I really needed my house to be aging in place compliant and, and we lost that. So it's really important to write these things down so that the builder, the designer, and the homeowner know exactly what has to be part of this part of this structure. It might even just be the number of bedrooms, uh, but we need to know that. And, and we need to find out things like this from our customer. Now, when it gets to the wants list, and as I mentioned, it can be some more of the, of the, the bling that might go into a house. But it also might be, I really want low energy bills and, and utility bills. I want a really low maintenance home. That's very, very important to me. I want uh, to design, I have an open design, or I wanna have protection from the grid growing, going down. <laughs> That's something that two weeks ago, we didn't think very much about the idea of the grid going down. In the last two weeks, we've learned a little bit about that. Much of mid-America was either on rolling power outages, rolling blackouts, or they lost electricity for days. And this is something that's important to a lot of individuals. So how do we get there? What do we do? Well, what does the structure have to do with it? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the walls and roof, right? How does that all play together? Well, I'd like you to watch a short video. It's just a 45 second video showing a structure going together. Often we talk about houses being a series of boxes put together. That was a very basic box, wasn't it? That was a very basic house, two-story, 
Uh, not, not very many angles, not very many changes in that house, but it illustrates a point. So what did Intercept ready to assemble SIPs do to address the wants and needs of that particular customer? Well, let's talk about this. Let's break it down. First of all, let's start with a need that is never on anybody's list. Nobody ever puts on their needs list. It has to be code compliant. <laughs> That's something they pretty much expect. It's a need in almost every place that we build. Now there's a few places still out there that there's no building inspectors. There's nobody out there uh, coming in and, and making sure it's compliant, but pretty much everywhere we build, most of the places we build, it has to be code compliant. Now being code compliant covers a couple of different areas. There's the structural code and there's the energy code. And both of these things have to be met. Now it's interesting when you talk to intercept SIP people, you will hear the term building down to code. Now that may be backwards from what you've always thought about. You may have always thought, no, 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 it's building up to code. But the reality is code is the minimum legal requirement for your home. It's the absolute least you can do for your home to be legal. That's not the standard that we're trying to achieve. It's the minimum standard, the lowest we can possibly go. So having that in mind, let's talk about how SIPs, first of all, meet the structural code and, and, and address the structural code. It's important that for, for you to know that the codes, are they, they vary from place to place, but our panels are designed and, and put together to meet your code. We need to know where you're, where you're building, what you're doing, what the specific details are of your home. But now we get into spans, we get into shear, as far as the wind speed, we get into loads, we get into snow loads, that varies from place to place. Here where I live in Southern Wisconsin, our legal snow load is 35 pounds a, a, a square foot on the roof. I'm helping design one right now in um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The snow load there is 80 pounds a square foot. So it's a completely different uh, animal that you're dealing with. Either way, the panels have to be designed to handle that. And we talk about our, our panels. One of the things that we're proud to talk about our panels with is that they're two and a half times stronger than a stick built house. Well, what does that mean? They are, when we factor in the loads and the shear and the, and the spans and all of the various things that the engineers love to, to talk about, uh, the diaphragm of the house and all of these various phrases that they, they like to use, what it boils down to is that our houses are two and a half times stronger than a two by six stick framed home, traditionally built home. That's a big deal. So the codes that were around years and years ago, we've been exceeding those codes for a long time and we continue to exceed those codes. And so, the, so structurally speaking, code compliance is something that's important and that is addressed. How about the, the energy code? Well, here again, this, this really comes into our wheelhouse about talking about uh, building down to code. The, the, the standard house that the industry tends to compare everything to is a 2006 uh, code house. Now, if you were to build a house in 2006 in this area, in this zone of the United States, you would need a two by six wall with fiberglass bad insulation of an R19. And that was it. That was all you needed uh, in your walls. And I don't know what the code was for, for the roof, um, probably an R40, maybe it was an R32 for the roof. Well, we've been exceeding that code for decades. We started building panels in 1981 and they were, we were exceeding that code back then. Little by little, the, the codes are starting to catch up with what we're doing, but we're continuing to exceed those codes. And so, that's one of the needs that's addressed, but you can see how easily this morphs right into the wants of your customer. So one of the wants is low energy bills. I, I want to have this house you know, pay for itself. I want to have this house uh, not be sucking me dry. Well, that, that is factored in to intercept SIP panels. There's no question about it. Uh, and, and this is something that is probably the most talked about feature when it comes to SIP panels is the energy, energy um, efficiency of the panels. It's not how they were designed. It's not how they were invented. 
uh, sandwich panels, stress skin panels. That goes all the way back to Frank Lloyd Wright in 1935 and cantilevering things. And it was more of the strength and the, and the capabilities of, of spans that kind of started the industry. But today we talk about low energy bills. To illustrate it, one customer, he says, uh, I moved into my house, nice, nice home in North Dakota. He says, I've been there for a while. And one day there's an XL energy car really slowly driving past. And a few minutes later, he really slowly drove past again. And he kept doing this. He says, throughout the day, I see this XL energy car driving past. He says, I finally went out and talked to him and said, what's up? He says, we're trying to figure out what's going on with your house because we have a, a, a formula for how much gas you should be using. And you're using a quarter of that. So we wanted to find out, are, are, is anybody living in this house? Is the meter broken? <laughs> what's going on uh, with this house? That really helps to illustrate the low energy bills, the energy efficiency of an intercept tip house. Another one of the wants of your customer may be, I nearly want a comfortable home. I want something that I can come in and relax in and, and not have to worry about, not have to, not have to be shivering because there's cold spots in the corners or uh, I, I, that the, the temperature difference between the first floor and the second floor are so substantial. Uh, this is something, again, that is, is absolutely addressed, even in that very simple box, that two-story box that we looked at being constructed. It, it, the, the comfortable factor is, is certainly built into that home. One customer said, talk, was talking about their home and they said, we went through a blizzard and, you know, uh, this was a while back. It wasn't our most recent blizzard, <laughs> but they said the wind chills were 50 below zero. And this too was in North Dakota. North Dakota doesn't have anything to stop the wind, right? <laughs> so when there's a, when there's a uh, below zero and strong winds coming in, it affects people's houses. They said they talked to their neighbors and they talked to their friends and people had a very, very difficult time getting their house to get to be above 60 degrees. They said our furnaces are never shutting off and we can't get our house to get above 60 degrees. And they said our intercept SIP house was 72 degrees, the furnace cycled, and it was as comfortable in there as ever. So that idea of addressing your customer and helping them to appreciate the comfort factor in a home. To go right along with that, something that maybe they haven't even thought about, maybe they kind of take for granted, is a drafty home. A lot of the houses we grew up in were drafty. A lot of them, uh, when the wind blew, the curtains moved a little bit, uh, th there was a draft on the floor. You got the kids up off the floor when it was cold weather. Um, if you walked by an outlet, you could feel the draft by the outlet. That was kind of standard business uh, with a lot of houses. One customer uh, talking about their home, they said that their electricity went out for nine, day, uh, for nine hours during a blizzard. It was zero out. And so they were very attuned to how their home was functioning. And they said, not only did it stay warm, but they said there was no drafts. Now, that's exactly when you would notice drafts. That's when you would be checking things. And, you know, the furnace isn't running, so, so there, there's no forced air going on. And you would really notice if there was drafts on a cold day like that while you were worried about the house cooling off too much. But they said they just weren't. This might address something to your customer that again, they don't even know how important it is to them. But they can sit, they can let their kids play on the floor uh, when, it's, when it's nasty cold outside, things of that nature. That basic box that we looked at or a very extravagant home with a lot of angles and a lot of changes and all of that built into it and ridge beams that are, that are uh, in, from various directions and so on, those, those same needs and wants are addressed in both situations. So this is, again, part of the conversation that you have with your customer. Why do intercept SIPs address those things? Well, it's a combination of our value, a lack of air infiltration, and a lack or re major reduction in thermal bridges. Now, if you wanna talk about those three things with 
an energy science geek, call your regional sales manager from Intercept, and we would love to talk your ear off about air infiltration and, and thermal bridges. But we're not going to bore the rest of you with that conversation. Uh, that's something that you have to want to talk about. But the reality is that combination uh, really does create an energy efficient structure that, that solves problems that some people don't even know that are, are able to be solved. And so it's, it's, a, it's the conversation that you want to be able to have with your customer, or if you're looking at building a home, you want to recognize how important this is to you. Other wants and needs, um, quick construction. A shortened construction um, period. Now that might be a want. I just want to get into my home as soon as possible. It might be a need. I sold my house and I need a place to live. Or I live on a lake and the, the association only gives us a short window to have open, open construction going on. Intercept steps you saw in that house that was built. Now again, that was a very basic structure, but you saw how quickly it went together. That's the beauty of ready to assemble panels. Very little was done on the job site. You might notice there was no dumpster there. Uh, there was no trash left over from the construction uh, part of building that house. And that helps you, helps you to see how quickly everything went together because it was already pre-cut and, and pre-sized and, and everything went together more quickly. So one customer, actually one of the same customers that talked about their furnace being out, uh, also made the comment that incidentally, she said, our neighbors started their house the same time we started ours. The contractors showed up every day, the builders were working every day. So it was pretty much apples to apples. And we got into our house a month sooner than our neighbors. So that can address one of those wants or possibly a need of your customers. So that that gives you an overview of some of the things that we can address with customers. Now, if we had more time, we could talk about it being cleaner. We could talk about it being quieter, healthier air, uh, more controllable, uh, tighter, things of that nature. But uh, let's, let's leave that for now uh, and let you get to your questions. But we just wanted to, to give you kind of, that, again, that overview of what we're talking about. Now, next time on Intercept, Present, Intercept U Presents, we're gonna talk very specifically about one of the nuts and bolts aspects of building an Intercept home, and it's the electrical. That's probably the most commonly asked question is how do I wire this? Now you can see the basics behind me, but we're gonna talk about the specifics of, of how you get the wires in there and how we, how we work with you as a homeowner, how much planning needs to be done from the builder's standpoint or the homeowner standpoint, and how much is already just built into the panels. So we'll get into that uh, next time. So now we're gonna open it up to some of the questions that you've texted in. And so we'll ask Mandy to share the first question. Sure, so the first question is, can you share with all of us the, the various sizes of panels we make, both in um, the length and the width of the panel? Good question, thank you. So that's a, that's, that's a nice question. When you look at the residential world, we're usually using a four foot wide panel. We buy our OSB in four foot by 24 foot length. So now when you're talking about a tall wall, a gable wall at the end of a house, that can usually be done in one panel, four feet wide. Now in some locations, it's appropriate to use what we call our jumbo panel, which is eight feet wide and up to 24 feet long. We custom cut our panels for your project. We don't produce a bunch of panels and then try to, to build your house. This isn't Legos. We, we, we refer to this as, as it's similar to building with Legos, but those blocks are all cut, right? You've got, a, you've got a very limited opportunity to change the design, but, but we, build, we build our panels as we need them for your house. And so every gable end is cut like along here, that, that cut is, is in the panel already. Um, all of the, the wall heights that you need for your particular project are put together for your project. So if you need a standard nine foot wall, which is nine foot one and an eight, that's how it finishes out. We do that and we make those all the time. But if you need something that's nine foot six and a half inches because you've got a, a curb on your house or something along those lines and it's a unique setting, it's no problem. We can customize those walls to fit your project. 
Mandy? And then to piggyback off of that, can you also share the thickness, the smallest and largest we can go? Sure. Typically speaking, we're building our panels at dimensional lumber sizes. Now we can do it at other sizes as well, but typically speaking, we're gonna build our panels at a four inch, so that a, a basically a two by four, which is three and a half inches of foam would fit in, or a two by six, which is five and a half inches of foam. That's what we have here. So this is a standard two by six that is used as a top plate, or we'll jump up to an eight inch wall and, and, and or a 10 inch. Now we can, we custom cut our foam. We buy our foam in big blocks, uh, two foot by three foot by 16 feet long. That's what our foam comes in. And then we custom cut it to exactly what we need. So if you have a unique need, we can do that. But typically speaking, we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do for walls. Most of the time, it's either a six inch or eight inch wall. Now, when you go to a roof panel, typically it's either a 10 inch or a 12 inch panel which uh, go, uses, again, dimensional lumber sizing. We can go up to 16 inch roof panels. So sometimes when we're talking to somebody who is really looking to get into that passive house uh, standard and they wanna meet the, the parameters that the passive house standard says, which is an R40 in the walls and an R60 in the roof. Well, we can make a 10 inch wall and a, and a 16 inch roof and meet that passive house standard. But most of the time we're gonna be talking about panels that go just with the dimensional lumber sizes. Hope that answers your question. What's next, Mandy? The next question is in regards to the video that was shown. The question is on the open ends of the floor trusses, do you make a quote plug for the cavities? We, we do. Well, it's not, not exactly a plug for the cavities. What we often do is have, have the floor joist that you saw on there set to the inside of the wall, and then we make a thinner panel, uh, a, a, rid, uh, a uh, rim joist, if you will, that goes around the outside and plugs that up. Now there's another way to handle that. That was kind of a standard platform construction project where you built the first floor, put the floor trusses on top of it, put your, your subfloor on, built your second floor. That is how most construction is done. The other option in that setting is to build your exterior walls because you can use that, that rim joist, but there's, sometimes you don't have a thick enough wall or there, you want more insulation than what that, that four inch panel or three and a half inch panel that we'll make to cover that area will provide. So another option is to take the, the, the floor joist that you saw there, the trusses in that particular instance and hang them so that they, I don't know, can you pick this up? Okay, but so there's, there's what we call a top mount hanger or a top flange hanger. It's, it's a hanger, a, a, a joist or a truss hanger that comes down the wall, but it, it comes way back into here and you can run your nails straight down into it. Then you can hang your floor joist so that it flushes out exactly with the top of this wall. Now you put your subfloor, your three quarter inch subfloor on and that runs all the way to the outside edge and your entire diaphragm. Now in that particular case, that square box of the first floor would have had that sheet of plywood going all the way to the outside edge, which really stabilizes everything. The engineers love it. My first reaction, the first time this was brought to my attention, this idea of, of using hangers like this was, but really the, the joists or the trusses are just gonna be hanging on steel hangers, is that okay? Well, it was explained to me that by the time you run the screws and glues of the plywood into those, that system and everything ties together, it's the strongest way to build a house. It's a really excellent way. And now you don't have any sill box to insulate. You don't even have any sill box to consider or to worry about. You've eliminated that. So what you're doing is, let's say those were uh, 16 inch floor trusses you build this wall 16 inches taller than, than you need it for your ceiling height. And then you hang your floor down and, and this is your, your sill box. You've got a sip wall, a six inch sip wall as, as that transition area and it's super tight. So that's, that's one way that it can be handled. So the other, the other option again is to build it inside because if you leave it just like that, what, what they showed on that, 
on that video. Um, that one, they would have probably just put OSB around that rim and then spray foamed it or bat insulated it or something to, to insulate that, which now becomes a weak spot in the overall wall cavity or, or wall um, efficiency. Mandy, anything else? Yeah, the next question is um, how close to a circular, or I'm sorry, how, how <laughs> circular can we make our walls? So either a curved wall or a, a turret maybe, um, the minimum radius if you happen to know that. So there's a couple of different ways. And I'll let Joe uh, um, chime in here as well. But there's a couple of different ways to achieve a radius wall. Uh, one is to actually bend the panel. And in that particular case, we're pretty limited. We can do it, we have done it. Uh, we've done some testing with it, but there has to be room in the, in the press to get all that in and it's, it's pretty limited. But what we can do is, is make a segmented wall. And at that point with a segmented wall, we can give you pr basically whatever radius you're looking for, whatever radius you want, but it will be uh, it will be segmented, so it's not actually truly curved, but we, you can, might go to our website and you can see some towers like lighthouses that we've built, and those were segmented as they went, as they went together. So Joe, you have anything to add to that? The same question gets asked a lot of times about roof panels and curving those, and you're spot on with your answer as far as either a segmented wall or the curved pieces um, that can be used and, and put together to create a barrel vault, for instance. And we're limited in, in the sense that the press that we use to manufacture that curved panel has a throw or, or a height limitation of about six feet. So that dimension from the spring line to the top of the, the curve is six feet. But it's very expensive to do that because you can only do one panel at a time. And then we have to use, since it's a square mold, we have to use, it's like a jello mold. We cut the piece out of the middle, put the panel into it, squish it all back together. We make one piece at a time. So it's very inefficient from that standpoint, but it can be done. So your answer was right on, John. Oh, I haven't said anything wrong yet. <laughs> Better than the last time, right? <laughs> All right. I hope, I hope that helps. Mandy, another question? Yeah, one more question. So can you talk about the windows and the door sizing um, as well as the quality of what they need to be? Sure. Yeah, good question. And it's a, it's, it's a very, very valid question uh, because when you build an intercept SIP house, you are building with really high quality um, products. You are looking for an overall wall wall um, efficiency that exceeds uh, anything that's that's done in standard construction and then you're cutting a hole in it <laughs> and so now that you have a hole in it you want to make sure you fill those holes whether it's doors or windows with very quality doors and windows now we're not saying you have to go out and get you know the passive house thirty five hundred dollars a window in order to make your house energy efficient that's that's not necessary but you do want to be, be very aware of the efficiency of your windows. You don't build this and then put a cheap leaky window in it. I was talking to a builder just yesterday and he made the comment, he says, you know, we can seal everything up, but you don't seal up the things that are operable, meaning doors and windows. You don't seal those up because you have to open them up. They have to be, that they're movable. And so you have to make sure that the manufacturer of those movable parts really knows what they're doing and is doing it in a way that's going to, to serve you well. So you take that into consideration that uh, this is something that you want to do right, right from the beginning uh, and, and do your research on doors and windows. So that brings us to the end of our half hour. And I promise that after a half hour, uh, I would let you all go uh, if, you, if you've had it with screen time. And we really appreciate you being here. Our next Intercept U presents will probably be in three weeks. And again, we'll talk about electricity. And what we're gonna do now is if you can use your, anybody who'd like to stay and talk about your projects or ask any other questions, you can use your raise hand feature down in reactions 
and we will call on you. You can unmute your mic and ask your question. And so we'd love to hear from you and we're welcome to stay. And we'll do this uh, up to 5.30 or up to the bottom of the hour, depending on what part of the country you're in, uh, if, if folks would like to ask questions. So anybody, would anybody like to ask a question? Yes. Do you guys do any of the design work or the, the structural engineering, you know, for like the center beam on, uh, say, if you're going to have a straight gable roof on a building? So we, we don't do, we, we have production drafters, but we also have all the span charts that, that, we are, that we need. So we can size that beam for you in most cases. Uh, we buy our beam from uh, a couple of different beams from a couple of different companies, and they will generally run it through their software and size it as well. If you need an engineer stamp on it, we send it out to have it stamped. But if you just need it sized for your particular project, we can we can help you with that. Okay, great. Thank you. You bet. Absolutely. All right. So. My two T is the what is what's on the, the the screen. Hi. Hi. So I got a question for you. I'm from down south, and our number one issue is humidity. So being a SIP as well insulated, how do I prevent the SIP from get moldy uh, moisture to build in? So what kind of system should I advise my HVAC guys to to install? Really, really good question. And you know, one of the one of the answers to that is to make sure they don't overbuild your air conditioning system. Because in your climate, it's especially it's really important for that air conditioning to run enough to dehumidify the air. We also kind of change our our thought process when we're down south as far as how we air seal our, our product, our our houses. Typically speaking, up here in Wisconsin or in South Dakota or in the colder climates, we put the air sealer on the inside because humid air, hot, humid air is always trying to move to the cooler, drier place. Now up here in the heating season, that cooler, drier place is outside. So our humid air from the inside of our house is trying to drive through the walls and windows and everywhere it can to get outside. Now in your climate, you have a, a longer season of the cooler, drier air being inside your house. And so the outside humidity trying to drive in. So we put the air sealers on the outside. We, we put the flashing tape on the outside so that uh, everything is covered as, as thoroughly as possible from allowing that to come in. So, so you take your, your, your system and make sure it's not overbuilt and then you also talk to them about an air exchange system. Um, up here, we use a heat recovery system. Well, you don't need a heat recovery system, but you do need an air to air exchange system to help uh, uh, control that climate on the inside of your house so that you can eliminate the humidity. So I may have just stolen a little bit of Joe's thunder, but do you have something to add, Joe? Yes, along the lines of the, the fresh air and the ventilation, um, the two systems, the acronyms are HRV and ERV. So HRV stands for heat recovery ventilation. ERV is the acronym for energy recovery ventilation. In northern climates, as John indicated, we would use the heat recovery ventilation system. So when we're minus 20 outside and we're exhausting 70 degree air, um, you, you use the heat recovery ventilator. In your situation, you're looking at keeping the humidity out of the house. So the ERV, the energy recovery ventilator, has a desiccant wheel in the middle of the, the air flows. And what that does is it absorbs the moisture from the outside and doesn't allow it into the building itself. So you want to be using an ERV ventilation system or, or fresh air as part of the fresh air intake system on the home. So John's right on on the rest of his, his comments. Okay, thank you. So now I talked earlier in, when I, in the presentation about building science geeks that love to talk about all of the, the science of, of total wall, uh, R value or, or U value. And 
you just got the guy that loves that. <laughs> Joe loves getting into the building science aspect of your structure. So any questions you have, you know, don't, don't hesitate. Even if your HVAC people want to talk to us about what we recommend or what, what we've seen, uh, we have a pretty good network of, of HVAC pros and a lot of experience in our own background uh, that can help. Now, not all of our sales managers are, 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 and are uh, building science geeks. Um, some of them just love this product. Uh, one of uh, one that wasn't able to make it here tonight. Uh, he's on the road, and so he wasn't able to make it. He said, "I'm not that building science geek. I'm not that guy that that loves all of the facets of that." He says, "I built one of these houses for myself, and I felt in love with it. <laughs> and I had to tell the world, and that's what motivated him to start selling um, intercept sip panels." So there's a lot of different uh, backgrounds that you have, but we do have a great network of people that can help you with your with your questions. Good. All right. Good, good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Kevin again. Oh, he need to unmute. Thank okay. you. I was just going to chime in quickly regards uh, Southern air conditioning controls and suggest the discussion with the contractor about a, an inverter driven heat pump with multiple stages so that Obviously, the unit could run at a lower output and dehumidify. That, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Oh, very nice. We appreciate your input. That's, that's, uh, that's, the kind of, that's, that's one of the values of this, this opportunity for all of us to get to talk. And the other Kevin. Okay. Um, my, my question was, what is your lead time? You know, this time of year, I, I'm assuming it's probably getting longer but you know say you got a set of plans two weeks from now what's your lead time from that time till you actually till delivery that, that's a good question and you're right it does vary from various parts of the year um, once you get through that draft the first thing we do is we take your plan and we do approval drawings and so that process varies because it might be exactly what you want the first time or we might go back and forth a couple of times part of that is how specific your drawings are, how detailed your drawings are. That really helps our production drafter to get it right the first time or to get what you're looking for the first time. So that's, that's part of it. So, but once you get through that, that approval drawing process and you say, yes, this is, this is what I'm looking for. Right now, we're at about a four week lead time from up ordering panels to delivery. Uh, things are coming in fast. Um, this is going to be a busy year, which is good, um, especially since we're not out there doing home shows. Uh, we, we were kind of concerned about how are we going to get in front of people this year. But there's a lot of pent up uh, building energy out there after a year of a lot of folks not doing anything because of the pandemic. And so we're expecting to see things stretch out. Typically speaking, through the summer, we're usually at that four to five week uh, lead time stage. Then when we get into August, September, October, uh, when people are in a hurry to get their structure up before snow flies, it gets a little longer uh, and it can stretch out uh, in that time of year. Um, but, but usually we're in that four to five week range. And, and we can be upfront with you when, when you're ready, when you're getting you know, closer to that, that process to tell you where we are at this point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Hey, John, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I not use Zoom very much. Mostly been a WebEx guy. Um, uh, two. I have two questions. One to feed back on something you had said earlier, uh, and that was, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, and I have literally about four thousand homes being built stick frame within about two miles of me, all mm -hmm. around me. And they're all building conventionally. And because we have similar, maybe not as cold as South Dakota, we do have um, the same type of climates, heat in the summer, cool, cold in the winter, not too much humidity like uh, one of my colleagues here in the South. But the old homes here used to be, uh, their um, moisture barrier was always on the inside, right behind the drywall. But I noticed all these homes now are being built with your uh, Tyvek systems and stuff on the exterior of it. Did you say that 
you're with this in a similar climate to what you have, you're putting that thermal or that uh, moisture barrier on the inside. Um, that's my one, one question. And then my second question is um, uh, a lot of basements are built here and they build them with stem walls. Uh, insulating a, a basement area, are you, are you, I've not seen any video to show you using a secondary wall in the basement to create the same thermal effect in the basement instead of using the mass of the concrete using the, the uh, SIPS system as being your thermal barrier in the basement? Those two are my two questions. All right, so Joe has his hand up, but since I already got a mic on, I'm going to answer this first and then I'm going to let Joe in. <laughs> so let's, go, let's talk about your first question first, as far as that, that air barrier, uh, moisture barrier. So what you're seeing in your area is Tyvek or a house wrap of some sort going on the outside. That is a breathable wrap. So that's not just a vapor barrier. The idea with that is that moisture or, or vapor can go through it so that that surface can dry to the outside, but water, which gets through every siding, there's not a siding out there. Somebody's gonna take issue with that, but I'm gonna say it anyway. There's, there's basically not a siding out there that doesn't allow some water to get through it. What you want in that situation is the water to get to the Tyvek, but not get to, to the structure of the house. The Tyvek stops that water at that point. The water molecules are too large to go through um, the, the, the Tyvek while they're in liquid form. Once they're in vapor form, they can go out. So now if some moisture does get to that OSB or that structure some way, it can dry to the outside. What we, what we talk about as far as a vapor barrier, vapor retardant, is the seams in our panels. Um, from panel to panel, we use a uh, flashing tape to stop that, and that stops the water. It doesn't allow it to go either direction. That stops the water solid right there. So that moisture that's trying to get to the cooler, drier place in the winter can't get through and can't drive into your wall and get into that joint. But you always want, to the extent possible, um, and this is, a, this is a big Joe thing, so I'm, I'm gonna steal his thunder. You always want every surface to be able to dry to the side that it gets wet. So on the inside, you want it to be able to dry to the inside. On the outside, you want it to be able to dry to the outside. And so we don't recommend putting a vapor barrier over the whole wall. Uh, we just do the joints so that if the, some moisture would get in, somehow get to this, we want it to be able to dry back in to the direction it came from. So does that answer that question? Yeah, it does. I just I just know that in the remodels that I've done here in this market, you pull the drywall off and you've got your plastic barrier there and then you have your insulation. And that's always where you're seeing your mold and your mildew and your dry rot is between that plastic barrier and the exterior. And, and Absolutely. I maybe I misunderstood what you said about lining the hole inside and not just the joints. So maybe that's what yeah. I'm so, so you're absolutely right. And in conventional uh, construction where you have a, a stud cavity, now you have air there that can condense, that can reach a dew point and create moisture. And that, that's where now all of a sudden that moisture forms and it hits the back of that plastic, that poly that's been hung, can't go anywhere. You've got a greenhouse basically at that point and it creates mold, it gets the insulation wet. One of the beauties of building with SIPs is you don't have that, that air in there. You don't, you don't have that, that stud cavity that can create condensation. And so, so uh, you've, re you've eliminated one issue just by building with the, the solid expanded polystyrene. Thank you, that's good. So Joe, do you have something to add before I get to a second question? Oh yeah, and I might take the second one myself if I can remember what the question was. <laughs> but um, Robert, what, what you've described is the difference between vapor barriers, and those are typically required by the code from a building science standpoint on the inside of the building. And they were there, they, they were put in the code to, to minimize vapor transfer from the inside of the building through that cavity construction. So that applies to stick frame construction. 
When you look at the SIPs, as John's been explaining those, we have solid wall construction, the EPS, OSB, and OSB skin, that in and of itself is a vapor barrier. The perm rating of that is much less than one. So our weak spot with the panel joints or with the panels are the joints themselves where air can actually move through it. Since air carries moisture, once that moisture hits a cold surface, which could be that exterior siding or the roofing material, that's where condensation would occur and the moisture would, would condense, form water droplets and get the exterior OSB wet at that point in time. So the tape that we apply on the joints stops that air from moving through those joints. Now, the Tyvek that you see and the house wrap that's applied on the exterior side of the building, that forms part of the drainage plane. And contractors and, and a lot of people that are building homes that don't get into the geeky stuff like I do, th there's a difference between that exterior side of things where you're looking at drainage planes and the interior side of the building where you're looking at vapor retarders. They serve two totally different purposes and they're often confused by everybody in the building industry. And I forget the second answer, so I'm gonna let, or second question. So I'm gonna let John go back to that one and then I'll, I'll throw my two cents in again. Remind me of your second question. The second question had to, had to do with a basement. Uh, building, oh, basement. Building a yeah. basement with stem walls, and you you might have a, a foundation in there that's that's a, a slab. Um, but a lot of people are converting basements that were not done originally. And now, when you're building a house with stem walls, and you're, you have that first floor that is a basement, uh, concrete's a great thermal holder, but are we using to maintain that temperature grain? Are we doing an internal wall in the basement with a SIP system too? Joe's already got his hand up, so I'm going to let Joe jump in. Thanks. It, I'll, I'll, I'll start at new construction, then go back to remodels. If, if you think about um, us as people, where do we put our coats and our hats and our gloves? They're all on the outside of our bodies. Houses are, and buildings are no different. The best place to put the insulation is in that exterior envelope. So starting at the foundation and, and working up to the roof, you should be at designing your system so that the exterior of your foundation walls are insulated below grade. And then up through this, the, the wall systems, you want your insulation as that exterior envelope. And then when you get to the roof system, you want that to be the exterior insulation. And where I've learned all of this, if you go to Building Science Corporation website, Joe Stebrook is one of the um, country's leading, well, Northern Hemisphere, um, as far as building science gurus and the studies that he and his company have done. And they're the ones that advocate this and have, have shown how this works. So if you think about that envelope is where you want to put things, that's the starting point. So now you go back to the remodel and, and that basement. And back in the day, they poured concrete or they stacked block and they stacked it up against the dirt and five feet down from the surface of the ground, the ground remains about 54 degrees all the time. And it doesn't change. So you have two choices at that point in time from a remodel. You can excavate around the outside of the basement and put rigid foam in, um, which is a good option from, from the standpoint of insulating. I'm not saying that's a cost-effective solution because it's very expensive to excavate and dig the yard up and all that kind of stuff. So your next best solution is to put rigid insulation on the interior of the wall so that you're actually separating, you're, you're breaking that thermal bridge between the, the, the ground to your concrete or your masonry unit and then to your interior living space that may be upwards of 60, 65 degrees down in the basement. So the rigid foam does that. 
don't put poly over the face of that because if you have electrical chases or leaks into that wall, that warm moist air from inside the building, which is still gonna be down in the basement, is gonna work its way into those cavities. You're gonna get condensation occurring in there. And as John had indicated earlier, you wanna be able to things to dry to the inside because they're certainly not gonna dry to the ground side of, of a basement. So by putting that vapor barrier, that poly in there, you're actually really hurting yourself. And unfortunately, John started, well, when he started this presentation out, he talked about building codes and building down or, or to code minimums. Building codes are oftentimes wrong in, in what they do and what they require us to do from a construction industry is detrimental to the structure itself. So I would direct your attention to, to Building Science Corporation's website and they have a lot of different assemblies on how to deal with these specific situations. Um, send me an email, joepasma at intercept.com. I'll be glad to send you that link um, after this and, and that will help direct you in the right direction that way. Thank you. Back to you, John. And, and just to, to circle back around a new construction, Intercept makes a subgrade panel. And we've had very good success with our subgrade panel. If it's a basement panel, it's got treated plywood on the outside. It does have studs in it. So it's not a, a true SIP, if you will. Um, it's a panelized wall system. Um, and it has the expanded polystyrene between the studs. Generally, it's an eight inch thick wall, depending on the depth that you need to go uh, with a, a treated two by eight, one foot on center around it. And it creates a, a beautiful, it, it does everything that Joe just talked about as far as where the insulation is and how it performs. It is subgrade wood. <laughs> and that's a very emotional topic for some individuals. It's been going on for a very long time. Uh, there's science to back it up. But again, you want your customer to be happy with it. So you never try to talk them into something that they're going to always regret and always wonder about. But it is an option worth investigating. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I've built a number of them over the years and have customers that tell me, bring your, your people that are talking about this, your, your prospects that wonder about this, bring them to my house. And, and I, I love showing off my basement because it, it is function. It feels like uh, it feels just like the upstairs. It doesn't have that wet, heavy feel of a basement. It doesn't have the concrete that's sweating all the time and the various features. But again, you want your customers to be very comfortable with what they're dealing with. Jamie has a hand up. Hey, John. Uh, Troy Bauer. Oh, um, hi, Troy. Not my wife's email, but um, getting back to that uh, HRV. Uh, the heating, um, I know we had talked about it. Maybe we could do it offline too, um, since it's about 5.30. Um, what would you prefer? Uh, go ahead, ask your question. I'm talking with the heating and ventilation guys, HVAC guys, with this uh, HRV, um, which we fully intend to do when we build here. Um, but they keep on telling me that, you know, with that scuttle system that I was talking to you about earlier this week, um, you're running double the amount of duct work um, with a heating HRV system versus, you know, the, what I would call, I don't even want to call it that, but with the scuttle system, um, am I just talking to the wrong HVAC guys? You, you or, know, maybe, um, maybe what's happening here, Troy, is we might be having a communication glitch with them because when we talk about the scuttle system, I talk to other HVAC guys and ask, okay, what are they referring to with a scuttle system? And what I got was it's simply a damper that is controlled by the barometric pressure and it equalizes the pressure between the inside of the house and outside. So if there's a negative pressure on the inside, it opens up and, uh, and allows the pressure to equalize. That's not an air exchange system. That's just an equalizer and it does meet code but it doesn't really address what we're talking about. So it might be, maybe, maybe they're talking about something different because an HRV system can work through your, your uh, HVAC system. Am right, Joe? Am I clear on that? Yes, in my house, um, I live in an intercept SIP house. Uh, we did an addition. So I, I 
got the best of all worlds, I guess. Um, and what we did is the the HRV that was installed, the this was back in 2000, the technology at that point or the, the idea at that point was that you put your draw points for the HRV where you're going to create the moisture. So I don't have bathroom fans in my house. My vents for the HRV system are in the bathrooms because that's where we generate the moisture. So that's the draw points that, that go down to the HRV system and then it's exhausted out the wall. And then the intake that comes in from the exterior of the building is just dumped into the plenum of the furnace. And then as the furnace runs, um, the fresh air is distributed throughout the house. Now that I have my furnace set up so that it runs whenever it needs to, I don't have the fan on continuous, but I do have the HRV, which, which happens to be a Van E brand. That was the big thing back then. Um, it runs continuous. So I run that continuous from about October through April or depends when the snow disappears and it starts getting warm out. And then as soon as the humidity starts climbing outside, I shut that off so that I'm not pulling moist, humid air from the Minnesota summertime back into the house. So that's how I deal with it. And the, the amount of extra duct work that Troy, you were talking about um, is it's probably four inch pipe and I'm probably got less than 50 feet of it. So to okay. be quite blunt, I think you're talking to the wrong HVAC guys. Thank you. Or, or, or we're on different pages. Maybe, maybe we're agreeing <laughs> and we're just using different technology. So it'd probably be a good idea just to find that out, uh, just to make sure, or terminology, I should say. Maybe we're just not using the, the, the appropriate terminology for them because, yeah, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be talking about a separate ventilation system. Uh, just to address something Joe said about running his continuously, uh, one of the things that systems now, Joe works out of his home, so he's home a lot. And so the comfort level is important for him all the time. When you're away from your home all day, a lot of folks don't run their HRV system while they're away all day. They start it about an hour before they're going to get home. And it changes the air over and brings in some, some fresh air and some more comfortable air. And they just run it on a, on a timer so like that. So that's something that can be talked about too and, and balanced out. Well, I promised that we would do a stop at 530 and we are there. Um, I know there's some more hands. I would be more than happy to address things uh, directly. Or again, you can get a hold of, of Intercept and find out who your regional sales manager is. And we will follow up with you. Or uh, if it's not an urgent question, save it for next time or email it to us anytime. And so we really thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, this afternoon, and we look forward to the next opportunity to be able to have a conversation with you.